This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast, we have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of September 2016, Mountain Glass is offering borosilicate sale, North Star odds and seconds, 30% off. All you have to do is put in the code NSOS in the checkout. And for all you soft glass nerds, soft glass COE 104 sale, 30% off. Creations is messy. Just put in the code messy, M E S S Y, at checkout. And for any other questions or concerns, go to mountainglass.com. That's mountainglass.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Bernoulli's principle, the shape of the pipe, along with an innovative intake system, creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 127. This is J. Michael, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories in hopes to inspire and entertain while helping you grow your business. And today is no exception. Today's guest is Nick Devely, who is co-founder of Glassroots Art Show Trade Show up in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Him and his wife founded this over seven years ago. And I was excited to get him on the show uh, as past episodes back. Myself and box fan Will Menzies uh, had a good discussion about Glassroots and kind of the logistics of getting yourself set up uh, financially and also just glass-wise and the thought process of going and setting up for a trade show. And now we've got Nick on uh, to actually discuss the forming and foundation of Glassroots, his inspiration into it. And uh, this was an overall just fun kind of shop talking, glass talk, uh, you know, just a lot of fun, a lot of business stuff. It's good stuff overall. And I hope you all enjoy this. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that uh, early in the recording of him and I's conversation, uh, I had a weird error come up on my recorder that I've never seen before. And we, uh, we actually lost the first about 30 minutes. That was also including his intro. And due to scheduling myself and also his crazy schedule, I uh, wasn't able to uh, get the re-recording of it because I want to get this out today. And uh, so I'm going to be bringing him back on again soon to uh, discuss the show, how it went, and also to follow up on the, our initial conversation, uh, which was actually some behind-the-scenes talk on his initial introduction into the community and the scene uh, and the functional glass world uh, where he was uh, behind the scenes during the filming for Degenerate Art. Uh, if you recall the scene where uh, Banjo and all the cats uh, are in this big studio working on that big giant black piece that they had that kind of the coffin kiln set up and it's late night and they're all having fun and being crazy and stuff and uh, he shared some some back behind the scenes kind of stuff of what was going on which I found to be very fascinating and uh, him and I sort of more or less agreed too that it probably was better that it didn't uh, we're not going to air it only because of those parties that were involved some things that were brought up in the conversation that I don't want to uh, put out there until I have their permission so actually what I'm going to be doing is reaching out to all these cats that were involved in this project uh, including Slinger uh, who I've actually already reached out to uh, to come on the show and do kind of a roundtable discussion uh, to talk about the making of uh, degenerate art and some of the behind the scenes stories that they have to share uh, as we all know, individually, we are all uh, somewhat reclusive and keep to ourselves in our little caves. That, and even if we share space with other artists, uh, we have fun and, and play with our, our friends in our studios. But likely, we're sitting behind our torch with our earbuds in or headphones on and we're jamming out to whatever we're listening to, whether music or podcasting or what have you. But then you get us all together in one space and watch the fuck out. We all have a lot of fun and let it all hang and loose because uh, we all enjoy each other's company and uh, we also all have a lot in common. Uh, 
besides being recluses, just the creative side and the spirit that we all have and just the energy and the passion for what we do as glass artists. So I thought it'd be fun to try to somehow coordinate uh, logistically wise to get these guys all together, uh, whether through a Skype group call or Google Hangout or something of that nature, and have a fun chat about that. So uh, we pick up in the interview basically where uh, Nick starts to talk about his actual inspiration for starting the trade show, uh, not necessarily where he was first introduced to the scene, which is fine. And uh, there is some controversial conversation going on too uh, about other stuff in the community, uh, trade show wise. That I was going to pull out, but I want to keep it in there because I really feel uh, the transparency of the show is, is what I like to keep it. I like to keep it real and keep it honest and also informative. And I want to make sure that you as, a, as an artist and someone that may actually go out and sell your work at a trade show understand uh, what's actually going on out there in the industry and the community uh, on a financial side. Uh, but also for yourself so that when you do get to a trade show and you decide you want to sell your work, uh, that you're fully prepared and understand what is going on uh, at these shows. So you'll hear when uh, later on in the conversation, uh, as, as Nick kind of unveils some things uh, that aren't just opinions, they're actual factual stuff that has happened to several artists uh, in our community uh, through other trade shows. So just a little teaser there on that. Um, also wanted to announce and say the how excited I am myself. Uh, I mean, I sound it here because if I get too excited, I will uh, screw the levels up on the, <laughs> on the recording here. But I will say... Uh, Glassroots is now officially our newest sponsor as well for the show, uh, which I'm super pumped about. Uh, they're going to help the, the growth of the show uh, as we continue to move into more of the educational space and also uh, you know, starting this uh, online course I'm going to be doing here soon. And when I say we, uh, really it's just me. It's me and my recorder and uh, all my computer software and uh, editing and blah, blah, blah. Um, I do have my guests that come on that co-host the show with me. Uh, but really the we I say is really me. Um, I have my support and my backing from my family and my friends and from you listening uh, as well. So that's why the where the we really comes in because I, I couldn't do this without you listening. I can't do this without my sponsors here on the show. And just the overall community in general and the amount of love that I have going on here and feeling and feedback. So thank you for tuning in and for downloading and for sharing this with your friends. It's truly humbling and I love it and I love you for listening. So thank you. Uh, so again, uh, Glassroots is now a part of our show as a sponsor, so you'll be up to date on all things going on at Glassroots as things come up, um, especially uh, as they get closer to the next round of uh, series and classes and uh, trade show next year for 2017. Definitely make sure you go to uh, glassrootsartshow.com. They have all the list of all the of all the layout, the fuller plan, all the classes that they're offering. Uh, this is the first year where they actually have an organized. Uh, class initiative that they're doing uh, where they've brought in amazing uh, artists slash teachers uh, from around the country. Uh, they're calling their education project and I believe there's seven uh, classes that are going to be going on simultaneously. If you're going to this trade show, not only to sell your work but going as a collector or just to go see the community and hang out, um, these classes that they're offering are only $200 uh, for the classes and uh, it's basically three days of instruction and you're getting everybody from Tito Byrne, Roger Paramore, Tracy Dreyer, Germ, uh, Jason Howard, uh, John Minky from Mobius, Robert Mickelson, Carmen Lazar, Brian Sirk, uh, Berserker. Uh, and uh, then they're doing a separate master class with Darby Home that is, uh, it's a separate ticket to get in. Uh, it's, it's a little higher price, as, uh, but the value, uh, they're going to be over delivering and under charging really for this class. Uh, it's uh, called How to Build a Better Bong, which I think is hilarious uh, just based on the, the bong word that uh, for me sometimes is like nails on a chalkboard. Uh, but that being said, uh, Darby is a master glass artist in our community. He's a dude's an awesome man, uh, father, teacher, educator. And because of that, they wanted to bring him on board, uh, not only to introduce him to Glass Roots, the trade show, but also to introduce our community to him as an instructor, a instructor and a teacher and a mentor. Uh, so that class is 1500 bucks. I believe they have a couple spots left. Uh, definitely check it out. And the other classes that they're offering, the group classes, uh, there's only 100 spots available. And again, it's $200 for three days of instruction. Uh, they're going to have different panels going on simultaneously, so you can pick and choose where you want to go and talk and listen and learn. Uh, but definitely all these things can be found at glassrootsartshow.com. And again, I'll have the links on the show notes page, as well as the website will have a, <coughs> excuse me, will have a page dedicated to them as a sponsor. And again, I'll have all the things uh, that are being up to date as well. And uh, Nick's a huge supporter of our industry and our community through past trade shows where he sponsored uh, all the events out there, the Michigan Project, the uh, Armadillo Glass Project, uh, 
Colorado projects, all the major projects that have gone on and that continue to run. And uh, so now he's officially a sponsor of this show. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Nick and to your wife, Mary, and to your family and to Glassroots and all those that are behind the scenes helping get that rocking and rolling. And uh, let's see, anything else I want to cover? Mm, not that I can think of, except for that uh, next coming up on the next episode, which will be 127. Uh, we're going to have Dustin Revere, uh, which I'm pretty pumped about. And i uh, going to be talking to him on Thursday evening. And then I'll be busting that show out and getting it out for you on Friday. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 127. If you have not yet subscribed, as always, please go to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Uh, leave me a rating on there, four or five stars, uh, five stars preferably. Uh, and leave a comment also. And as you uh, do this, uh, it will actually help iTunes recognize the podcast as being active and listened to and commented on, which will then move it up in the ranks, which will then expose the show to more people. And the more people we can expose to our industry and our community and the happenings inside of it, uh, the better we all are going to be off in the future. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Take care. Love you. Peace. trade show it happened one time it was in the um, Portland Convention Center and at that point in time I had been communicating a lot with uh, Mad City from Toke City okay. who um, is based in Madison so we were introduced through a mutual uh, friend Freak Glass Freak Madison um, Don was doing the glass aficionado at the time and I was just moving a lot of glass both high end and low end and was part of the private glass forum the pgf back in the day that was like the spot if you wanted to get your hands on nice stuff so he uh, offered to send me out to this event called the organ hookup and rep the um ninja that was the other guy do you remember this stuff yeah Man it's City and ninja from toke city yeah so, yeah it sounds familiar <laughs> I, I wasn't really in like myself personally like i was into some of the glass forums but like I kind of stayed away from the technology and the groups just because there was always so much drama and kind of soap opera crap going on. That was, you know, I just got yeah. tired of all oh, of this it. So. Is, this, but this was where uh, I think they were overgrow people or whatever it was, the, the big site that got shut down, overgrown or overgrow. Okay. And then they started uh, Tope City. And from, from that, I guess, a few high-end artists got on there in uh, Mad City saw this stuff and i'm pretty sure that's where the exp i mean you can really credit exposure wise uh a lot to to don with toke city mad city is his uh screen name you know in terms of like nice photography and people like royal slinger kenneru uh jason lee a lot of those dudes i remember in like 2005 and 6 right when i started look 2006 it would have been looking at toke city maybe 2007 a lot of those guys were already, you know, a couple of your members. So just a little background on that. But he sends me out to rep the magazine that him and Ninja were putting out um, called Glass Aficionado. And got out to the show, saw potential. I had never been to, I'm assuming AG was probably in its second year, maybe first year, second year. Champs was obviously still around and doing its thing. But I came home from that show and looked at my wife and said, we're going to do a trade show <laughs> in Madison and uh, got on the phone with Don. Don had the computer graphic skills and Toke City with all those head shops. I mean, it seemed like a lot of people in all aspects were looking at it. So that was our platform to advertise. Hell yeah. And I just started calling artists from around the country. I had never spoken to met, heard of. We ended up, having a 50 booth show uh all the booths were filled so that was the first time that i had met chad g 
uh, Cherry Glass, Devin and Paul showed up in almost no pipes in their booth, and they had really nice pedestals. And I remember Paul having like his pimp cane uh, micro, and it was my oh, yeah. first exposure to like really nice uh, non-functional glass, you know. Um, and there's so many others that that still support the show that were at this thing. But the neat thing was the flame off we did in 2009. It was um, six teams, three teams one day, three teams the next day, and we randomly drew hats out of names out of a hat, and that's who you ended up with. So like Freak and Bear Claw were a team, Eric Ross and Salt were a team, Ghost and Brandon Martin were a team, uh, Christina Cody and Alex K, um, Alex Vicnair and Billy Goat, and it was Lupe and. Orhees, maybe those I think those were the six teams but it was December like 8th or 9th or something that we decided to do the show it was we couldn't get in in October and November and it was beautiful like 40 degrees and beautiful for Wisconsin 40 degrees like the few days leading up to it and the night before the warehouse thing opened up uh, we got 18 inches of snow, and it went from 40 degrees to, like, negative 10, negative 8. Holy shit. Shut down the campus. Shut down the whole city. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the campus had not closed school due to snow or ice in a couple decades. God. <laughs> the first Lord. day. And we're in a warehouse, unheated. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. <laughs> well, no, it, it happened. I mean, like, 250, 300 people showed up from around the country. Wow, that's Midwest. awesome to yeah. watch this thing gave away a bunch of free beer and pizza daryl from blast shield was there uh thomas from glass alchemy was there um i want to say abe might have been there the last day i mean it for like us being nobody in this thing never having existed it's a it's a good idea of how hungry the industry was in 2009 and now you know fast forward four years how just fed up everybody is with you know just you know we'll get to that later yeah but that that was our first uh, show was Madison and the inspiration definitely came from the Oregon hookup uh, and just seeing a community show because I knew Vegas existed and I had heard a lot of mixed feelings but it's it's nobody's community per se I know now they have more of a glass blowing community but I don't believe they did you know eight ten years ago so really it's just a destination cheap and easy to get to it makes sense it's a convention set you know capital yeah. of the United States I'm not knocking Vegas. Yeah, it's not my uh, cup of tea, though. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I have... Uh, I was telling you before, in, in the support I've shown um, all the other shows in one way or another, I've definitely paid uh, cash to sponsor AGE two times. Uh, I've vended at both the Alexis Park and the Rumor. You know, I've been to AGE four or five times. And the last time I went was the rumor show, and I knew at that point um, it was it was going backwards. Uh, the the whole dab thing was really starting to take its strong foot in the industry and also uh, in business ethic. And that's one of the reasons why I really like the platform of being on a show floor amongst all of your peers. Is you are then um, what's the word not judged or controlled but uh um you fuck up you fuck up in front of everybody yeah it gives you, you know? accountability so it, it holds you accountable that's what i'm yeah. trying to say yeah. and the accountability that comes from being in a room uh it it really does um weed out the, the negative ones you know i'm probably of the more negative people at the trade show <laughs> <laughs> i would be too <laughs> uh but, yeah, I mean, in champs, I've definitely uh, gone to and vended at three, four champ shows. Either Spiral O Glass, which was like the pseudo name that I had for my, um, when, when I was just beating the streets, selling stuff out of gun cases pre-glass roots. Uh, and, you know, vended three or four times. I've sponsored their shows. I've, I've done my best to get along um, with Jeff with Eric and Ellen, uh, and, and with Gustavo, you know, um, Gustavo just has his own thing going on. 
and we're we're different worlds so there's not much we can do to work with each other and i'm, I'm not gonna you know deny that him doing a show five days before mine last year and 10 days before glass roots this year when four years ago there was nothing that existed anywhere around and i'm not saying you can't get close but i mean no, but some of these dates, dude, I questioned it myself. Like, I saw, like, one show starting at the next one ends, and they're in, like, completely different ends of the country. It's like, what the fuck's going Ooh, on? Here, check this out. 2012, you know, so the first show was 2009, and that was the Great Lakes Art Show. Uh, Don and I didn't agree on a lot of stuff. He he went with Toke City in the magazine, and I continued doing the show. Uh, I turned it into the Glass Roots Art Show. My wife took over the graphics and the website and all that stuff. 2012, Jason Harris does the circus deal. I forget what it was called in Atlantic City. He does it October. He does it right over Halloween or right after. And my show dates are November 2nd, 3rd, 4th. So that was my first real taste in someone really stepping on the nuts. And then 2013 champs or big uh, go it's champs I think it's the first time either that or 14 but I know that it was consecutive years in a row champs their first show went within four days of my show in Colorado hmm. um, you got AGE their first East Coast show two years ago choosing to do their their um, Baltimore show five days before my show I mean, these are very, like, you know, strategic, well-thought-out, placed, and it's never worked. It just pisses everybody off. It makes, you know, obviously it, it, it hasn't worked for age at all. I'm pretty sure that they just had to um, pull this Philadelphia show. I don't know if most people know it was going to be in Philly, but supposedly they were going to do an East Coast Philly show. Huh. But finally, the vendors are starting to speak with their wallet you know, right. in their in their minds and their ethics where a few years ago, I think um, it was just so confusing for everybody because there was so much marketing from the trade shows. It just seems logistically Dang. wise, though, man. Like, fuck, you know, if, you're trying if to we do, could get you know? along, there's enough for everybody. Yeah. You know, so yeah. when I when I pulled the Austin show, I had 35 shops to turn out for my second Austin show. The first show I did, I had more shops than I've ever had show up. It was like 260, 275 legitimate um, brick and mortar or legitimate online shops. You know, so when when I hear that Champs brings in 2,000 buyers, individual buyers of their show, <laughs> no, not, no, not that that's not true. And no matter how many times that it's said, it's still not true. <laughs> it's you know the the reverse of basic politics I guess but it's very much political in its own you know way. Interesting. But we we were asked not to do the show on 420 the following year in Austin because people just felt like it was taking away from and the the show dates weren't directly on 420 it was like 21st and 22nd and I thought man, it's an awesome opportunity to celebrate the culture. We were across the street from Reggae Fest. Uh, 250,000, 200,000 people show up over three days to this thing. We were directly across the street with glass blowing. It was the first Armadillo Art Glass Initiative. So okay. that year was an awesome Austin show, but it was over 420. So people asked me not to do it on 420, and I moved the dates to May, and I had 35 shops show up. It was embarrassing. I mean, a lot of vendors claim they did good, but I know a lot of vendors did really fucking terrible. But more to the fact, you had like two or three AGs at that point, two big, like five champs, because they had one in Canada plus Colorado to Vegas and an East Coast. So I, I did the right thing. I stepped up. I pulled the show. Uh, it ended up being like a 300-comment thread. You know, this was like June of 2014 um, on Facebook. And nothing changed. I thought maybe it would. I thought uh, these other trade shows would um, possibly want to sit down and talk. But there's so much dirty bad blood, I'm pretty sure, between a few of them because of just, like, magazine, book, advertising. Gustavo is a longtime champs vendor, right? And then, boom, Gustavo is now a trade show runner. Right. And he runs a, a magazine that these other trade shows are advertising through. 
so there's just there's so much just like underhanded shit. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. That's been done. It is weird because it's 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 so obvious to so many people, but conversations like what I'm doing right now just don't happen. Yeah. You know, and people don't want to. Ooh, you know, I still vendor. You know, it's like what the fuck. You know, did he rip you off? Did they rip you off? Were you ripped off? Yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna go back and vend again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what the, the fuck? fuck are yeah. you doing? It's like stick up my ass even more, please. <laughs> oh man, and and now we're in the age of just free booze, and that's the one thing. Well, not I have a lot of things I've stuck to, but one of the key things that Glassroots has never done is grow outside of its um, space, its comfort zone. So I've had the same floor plan for this will be four years, my fourth show, with not increasing the square footage of my floor plan. Nice. And what that means, every time a few more buyers show up or vendors I'm not immediately saying, great, let's get bigger. I'm, I'm waiting for it to burst at the seams, and, it, and it's worked. And you just look at this last January AGE show, filling four full floors on the Hard Rock on top of two full rooms. I mean, maybe if it's a five-day show, you can justify doing that. Right. You know? But uh, it's impossible for an educated buyer to make the rounds. And to see everybody because you're so spaced out. And hotel rooms were never meant to be, almost if you do like the Gem and Mineral where they do it in a hotel room, and that fucking thing's a month long, right? Yeah. So people that go to that go for like two weeks and they do go room to room and they do garner those, you know, they, they get relationships and build them. And, uh, you know, so I know I'm going on a bit of a rant, but people vendors uh the glass artists themselves i think are starting to wake up to good business um and what isn't good business and there's really no voice for your everyday lamp worker in this community at all and, you know most yeah. industries that are making the kind of money that this industry is making uh, have lobbyists have attorneys they have a guild they have unions it's it's fucking mind-boggling to me that there's so much resistance to all this. You know, I've brought it up for five years, and I know AGE tried, but they did it with ill intent, and people saw through it. But really, they couldn't get anywhere with it either because everybody, their intention for the most part when they join these things is, what am I going to get out of it? Yeah, exactly. Not, not what is this going to do for my future and career 10 years from now along with my buddy and my shop mate, and even the people that you fucking don't like. I mean, you're all, like, we are all feeding off of the same tip when it comes to people spending money on glass art made by American pipe artists. Yeah, and then we're also all having to abide by the same federal laws that are out there, no matter what state you live in, too. You know, it's like you're saying, like, uh, part of part of my, my reasoning for doing the show is, like, what you're saying is to have a voice for the small guy or for, or for me really for the community in general. And, and I, I hope that eventually through the show and through, I, um, I've had Luke Zimmerman on who's a huge advocate for our industry and as a lawyer and a cannabis lawyer out in Oregon in California. And we, him and I've been talking about it behind the scenes. Like, you know, it's a, ideally it would be nice if down the road we have some kind of representation as whether it's a lobbyist or some kind of a union of some sort, because as the state laws change, there's nobody there saying, hey, as your cannabis laws change, this law needs to change too. And they're like, the, you know, the cannabis laws change, but then the paraphernalia laws stay the same. So then the... Beyond the laws, you know, just just wording. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, like like yeah. The, the vice thing. Um, have you seen this four or five minute clip? Uh, Mr. Gray is what he's going by. Um I don't know why he's using an alias because uh, his buddy calls him out and says his real name <laughs> in the video. But Vice just did a thing on all these high-end pieces, and they just repeatedly used the word bong huh. over and over and over again. And I'm not offended by the word bong. It was more the fact that, like, the kid's dad stuck money in his pocket and just how fucking sloppy they made the people involved look. It seemed like it was almost like a parody. And and I watched Slinger write 
bad press, good press, all, all, you know, bad press is still good press. And, you know, I, I saw that on maybe D Rex thing uh, on Facebook. And, you know, I got to say at, at some point, bad education, bad education. Yeah, I completely you know? agree. Absolutely. It's, it's, I get it. Like, yeah, they just put these humongous price pieces made by a select few people in the industry who just keep getting the fucking repeat button pushed on them. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, um, misleading, I guess, if you will. Yeah. But, you know, these, yeah. these few like highlights to be the constant highlights. I don't mean the artists. I just mean the collectible pieces. Cause there's so much fucking nice glass being made by like, thousands of people. Thousands. Yeah, man, and that word "bong," dude. Like, I I ran a smoke shop for like five years, so like for me, that word is like I I, I, I still it's hard for me to say it. <laughs> as stupid as it is, <laughs> cool. it's like nails on a chalkboard for me, and it's and it's because it's also in the federal law. It states that blah blah blah, this cannot be used. Like in Florida, a couple years ago, they tried passing this what they're going to call the bong tax, where they were going to actually. I was a member of it, absolutely. You know, they were trying to legalize it. Yes. And they say, yeah, you can sell pipes, but you got to pay a tax, and it's got to be called the bong tax. And when you pay the bong tax, well, now you're calling it what you're selling as a bong, which is now federally illegal. So now we can just come shut you down and take all your shit. <laughs> so, well, they found a different way. I, I was a member of that Florida thing that Grateful J uh, okay. headed up, you know, um, and I, I got in and listened to the conversations many times i never spoke much if any at all but the lobbyists the attorneys um they were really being attacked you know it was uh, yeah. do you remember all this oh yeah dude i i i remember it because my my pocketbook was empty for about six months because <laughs> oh, no so I no you live in florida. yeah you i'm in florida oh yeah oh, oh yeah dude nightmare. yeah yeah i've been okay. i've been living in yeah i've been here my whole life <laughs> So I've been affected in our industry and like the Florida industry is just it's weird as it is. And then all of a sudden we have these jackasses, this Darren Russo, whatever the hell his name is, guy, senator. And like, you know, there's I don't know. The Florida politics are fucking stupid as it is. But it's just it's it's just the community's huge. I love it here. But the politics are fucked. More to the word bong. Snodgrass really did change my mind. Uh, at some point, we do have to um, step out of the fear of the federal government. I agree. And, and I'm not a shop owner, so I can't speak to that. And by no means am I condoning saying the word bong in a shop where I know that that will. But, uh, you know, the, the, he looks at the bong. Yeah. It's a, it's a, <laughs> and it defines it. I know it's perfect, but I felt the same way. I was like, oh, that's nice to hear that in a good way. <laughs> so so we're doing a Darby class this year, and Darby decided to name it uh, Building a Better Bong. And huh. they asked, of course, beforehand if they could name it that. And I didn't even think twice. Yes, you can You can name your class Building a Better Bong. And, you know, at some point uh, when that word is used in the right context or the right light, it gives it back a beautiful sound and meaning instead of this, like, fucking fear-mongered, uh, fed right, federally imposed sanction that if not otherwise, everybody would be using the word bong because it's an awesome word. Yep. It sounds awesome. And it's a bong. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. So, so being in Madison, like how are the politics there? I mean, being a small town, you know, somewhat rural, like, I mean, I, I, from what I've, you know, talking with box fan, he was saying, you know, like the local community, they support what you're doing as an, as an art yeah. event, you know, well, but <laughs> yeah, I know you're still treading on thin ice. It. I don't know if they don't support it. I think they just, um, they, I gotta be careful who they call they. Right. So, so I live, um, almost four hours north of Madison in sister Bay. So I'm very rural where I'm at. I'm in the peninsula, but Madison is not as big as Milwaukee. It's, uh, but it's still, I want to say like between 200 and 250. And I know the suburbs of Madison have really grown and Madison's one of those cities that our government has chosen to just directly gentrify and it's been going on, but now it's happening heavy, heavy. Hmm. Um, like they're doing in Portland, like they just did in Austin, like they did in Williamsburg. Uh, I'm pretty sure Seattle was done up about a decade ago, but uh, really drawing the lines in the sand on who can live where and removing the homeless people and all that kind of stuff, which is unfortunate because Madison was the home of the Vietnam protest. You know, it, 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 people often overlook what went on in Madison during the end of the protest for Vietnam, but other than like the big ones in California, this was the spot. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. They, 
they got monuments, you know, and, and plaques and stuff on State Street describing, showing pictures of, like, the police. I don't want to use brutality. It's just, uh, just fucking sickness that, yeah. that's been going on in this country. So Madison is very open-minded to, it would, it would appear, herb. Um, back in 2007 and 2008, I went to my first two harvest fests in Madison. And, I mean, they smoke weed from campus. There's this street you don't drive down. There's no cars. And it's, uh, again, 15 years ago, there was no big chains, maybe one or two. And now it's fucking just, like, all this ridiculous shit. Qdoba and Subway and, you know, just Jimmy John's and, like, every other block. And the mom and pop shops are leaving, so I'm assuming Harvest Fest will eventually be shut down. But the year after the Vietnam protests ended, um, basically these Harvest Fests started up. And it was still a way for people to peacefully assemble and speak their mind. And they went right after, uh, the, the marijuana activists went right after the legalization in Wisconsin. So when I got there the first year... Um, growing up in Green Bay, I mean, you know, you, you go to jail for, for doing any number of the things I saw going on, and we're on campus, and then the march goes diagonal down the street, and it dead ends at the Capitol steps. And we get to the Capitol steps, and this punk rock band is playing uh, punk rock on the steps of the Capitol, and people are smoking herb and handing out goo balls, and there's bongs, and it was fucking nuts. Cops were just standing around making sure people, like, didn't I don't know what they were making sure <laughs> <Not choking, laughs> they weren't arresting people. So, so, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that at least they were open-minded enough not to, it was, you know, seeing that gave me more confidence to yeah. go to the Monona Terrace in 2009 and approach David, who is still with me to this day uh, at the Terrace and say, Hey, I want to put a, a bong show on and dude, the Monona Terrace is a Frank Lloyd Wright building. Yeah, that's what I was hearing. Extremely high end, you know, like uh, it's it's got to be in the top ten convention places in the country to do um, this type of thing, you know. So you walk outside and you're looking at the Capitol one block away on one side, and you're looking at Lake Monona, right there. I'm not. I mean, dude, like the the building ends, and people fish outside of the doorway of the trade show. So you've got your transient or your homeless folks fishing right there <laughs> it's wow. fucking awesome huh. you know what i'm saying it's, it's beautiful you know like you're you're there the cop shops directly across the street from the show and in the eight years we've done the show we've had um, a knock on some wood right now no <laughs> arrests and and they're very kind to us we we are like the third or fourth largest convention in the monona terrace i, I can't say the city of madison because they have like world dairy expo and Iron Man and Trek and shit, but I know that we fill up a bunch of hotels, and you know our group, right? I mean, yeah. They come in and eat and drink their way through everything. Yeah. So like you're you're walking distance to everything you want in Madison from the convention center. So in that regard, yes, the city embraces us. The Hilton turns their head; they don't give out, you know, smoking fines. They don't. Um, but we're also really respectful. You know, I, I I made a rule in 2010 and made people sign it that if you were going to sleep at the Hilton as your hotel of choice, which is connected to the Monona Terrace, if I found out from the hotel that you got a smoking fine in your room, you were asked to leave the show. Not after, like right there. Nice. The fuck out. Good. Well, I, I mean, dude, I wanted this relationship to, you know, grow yeah, and to last. Absolutely. And and what we did was we we had everybody that wanted to do whatever they wanted go to the Sheraton, and it was ridiculous. <laughs> Look, looking back, it was a bad idea because I mean there was like floors filled with people just smoking air. People took it as like you could do it there, and it was more <laughs> just I don't give a fuck if you do, but so like they. They had to crack down a little bit, but um, I mean, I'm talking to the point where I'm pretty sure they turned off hallway smoke alarms because, like, the level of smoke was visible in the hallway. My God, Cheech and Chong showed up all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and uh, what are you what are you gonna do, right? You yeah. can't. As a show promoter, I wasn't even burning at the time. I was very straight laced in 2009 and 10 in terms of like sobriety and all that stuff. So it was. 
difficult for me not to be overboard almost like a dad because I knew the city wasn't going to embrace just ridiculous shit, you know? And, and so I had to like, how do you ask somebody or tell somebody you, you can, you just can't do it here, you know? So it, it was, that was probably the most difficult thing I had to deal with in the first like two, three years of the trade show was just figuring out how to corral 50 people smoking joints right outside on public land and get them to walk like a hundred, you know, yeah. don't do it in front of the doors and stuff like that. Yeah, dude. Cause, cause like I've, I've heard rumors that Vegas, like when they, they were at the hard rock last year for age that like they had the porn industry there, like I guess a week before with age came there and they were supposedly not letting the age come back because they couldn't deal with and handle what was going on. We were more rowdy and crazy than the fucking porn stars. Check it out. Gustavo did a trade show, his first ever trade show, at the Hard Rock. And AG, they did it right over the top of AG. Same dates, identical, across the street from the Alexis Park. So the Hard Rock and Alexis Park are off of the Strip, a a mile off the Strip. And the Strip is like the fucking big to-do, you know, ridiculous, like just like the true epitome of disgusting fucking America. Yeah. So you go down Paradise Boulevard or whatever, and you get to, I'm not sure what it is, but you get to the Hard Rock right across the street to Alexis Park. Gustavo was also not asked to come back after his first trade show hmm. at the Hard Rock. And I've stayed at the Hard Rock. That's where I stay if I if I was going to either Champs or AG, because I dig the Hard Rock because I can behave myself, and it's fucking loud metal music, and I love metal. and just it, it was just easy, and it was a spot that I was comfortable going back to, you know, usually I got to do this by myself and I don't really enjoy traveling without my family. So given that Gustavo was asked not to come back, I don't know how they thought that doing another show there, but like Gustavo just did it in the trade show rooms. They rented four floors and I'm pretty confident that the hotel themselves had no idea that the four floors that they rented to vendors were actually going to be, uh, booths uh, in fact i fucking know this for a oh, interesting the hotel didn't know that's why the hotel stuff was all or the the you got to have a card right to get in and to go to your floor right well how do you not have the foresight to figure out that all these buyers that aren't staying at the hard rock aren't going to be able to access the four floors of glass it was insane, you know, the whole mentality and, and just the way the Hard Rock treated the vendors that were moving their beds to put tables down for glass. Every one of those people got a $1,500 fine. Holy and shit. And it was put right on their card, and I know a number of people that got that fine. Damn, that's you know, crazy. And, and I know, uh, so I, gotta, like, I don't want to get too personal with how bad these people fucked up, but, I mean, I have had so many conversations with people who were there. You know, not a friend of a friend, not a friend of just like I was there. This is the fine I got. This is what I was told I couldn't, couldn't do. So, you know, shame on them for putting on another trade show, the International Cannabis Expo, ICE, ICE. I mean, who the fuck names a show ICE? (laughs) And 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 telling their vendors that they can't vend at AG at, at Alexis Park. Because Alexis Park won't rent it back to them when, in fact, they're fucking putting on another show. Like, dude, shame on them. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, it is. It really is. And and then the vendors started figuring out because they started seeing all these people with badges. Well, we're and so they didn't let the Alexis. They let the Alexis Park people in for free to the Hard Rock, but they would not let the people that were vending at the Hard Rock in to the Ice Show. I'm not sure the politics behind that, but I noticed that AG. AG now has a show back at Alexis Park again for this upcoming winter show. So this will be the fourth time they've left the Alexis Park and come back between Rumor, Hard Rock. Um, they did the warehouse, you know, and I just, I'm speaking about all this because I feel like it needs to be said publicly. And I know it falls short on a lot of people's voices, you know, that don't feel like they have a voice, but I have just emails and voicemails and just, you know, what should I do? What can I do? Yeah. Yeah, man. You can do, you can do do glass Vegas, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. It's going to happen the same dates as, uh, or right before champs and right with champs at the uh, Westgate, 
right next door to the Las Vegas Convention Center. And the uh, Creative Endeavors folks who have been doing um, the Glass Craft Feed Expo for over 20 years are going to be putting this trade show on. They're very organized, professional. That's what I tell people to do. Go sign yourself up for Glass Vegas. Get a booth while you can. Yeah. Yeah, man. And it's, and, and it's so expensive. Do you know the logistically wise to have all your stuff shipped out there, get the hotel set up, rental cars, everything else. And it's it's five to ten thousand dollars depending on how much you know you want to have out there. It's and then you find out that you go there and then you can't do half the shit you want to do and then you're fined and that's it's just crazy. That's one thing, but to find out that you don't even see a buyer. I mean, dude, like yeah, you know, I'm not crazy. gonna name drop, but a few of the guys that I'm on the phone with, they just finally packed up and went downstairs because they needed to make sales. And th- this is why I'm talking about this. AG is not my competition. They, they, AG and Glass Roots are two different worlds at this point. You know, they're very much focused on just filling spots and not educating people. And we have taken that step that they did. I mean, I went to the lectures when Jody Grimmett, Ken from Chameleon, like I sat there and participated in the uh, Alexis Park panels that they had i've always been interested in hearing what people that wanted to be said you know um, heard had to say about different um political things if you will you know but it just they they never followed through and so the education project it doesn't pick up where they left off because they didn't really focus on stuff on the torch but just that that need for people to want to learn and that's what i mean like we're not competition at this point yeah you know, exactly. they don't affect my show I don't affect their show. They're going to continue to do what they're doing. I just hope that at some point uh, they make a public apology and start righting all the wrongs, you know, give back money to some of these folks who like seriously were so fucked after that show broke is a joke. And these are people that I'm friends with. And so I'm speaking from a, like a personal standpoint, if you will, on this. And yeah. I don't, I mean, I saw one thread on Facebook, Andy Ray, Otherwise, I didn't even see shit on social media. I, yeah, I mean, I, I've only heard about it by interviewing guests on the show that that went there and experienced it themselves firsthand. That's the only way I've ever known about it, especially because I don't go to the trade shows much out there, or ever in Vegas at least. That's crazy. But yeah, man. So, I miss it, man. It was it was a, it was the spot. AG was the spot. The first one I ever went to. I remember walking into Darby and Buck's room, and it fucking blew my mind. I mean, they had. That's where I first got to meet Delene. There was, it was just, it was love. It really was. Yeah. You know, there was so many good artists. That's where I met David Popovich for the first time. I mean, just, it drew out people that didn't, and, and Madison's hard to get to, you know, so I don't expect everybody to come and it's, you got to go out of your way to get to it. So, you know, I'm not knocking the idea of Vegas. I'm just saying people's business models changed, but their name didn't. So American Glass Expo is a far cry from what's going on these days you know contemporary handmade american products is what champs is i mean what the fuck yeah. <laughs> it's like the exact opposite no. of what it is no that's not what you know like let's just think about it real quick that's what i ask vendors is do you even know what these names stand for you know do you do you think about what you're doing with your dollar and that's enough about the the other trade shows yeah man <laughs> yeah dude so to move forward <laughs> so the uh so so you so you did the austin deal and then uh then you moved into madison so and then no i was in madison since 2009 okay we did two shows in uh in 13 and 14 um and we did them before ag and big show did a colorado 420 show oh okay okay that's what it was okay so colorado happened legalized and the big show and ag both went there and did colorado shows and that's really what did me in in that 2014 show was a lot of the vendors that were doing my show went and vended either ag or the big show and it was you know, i got like basically um the pick through a lot of the head shops in texas went to those shows so i mean dude i'm talking in Austin, there's like fucking 35 shops, you know, alone. And I bet five of them came to the show that was within like three miles of their shop. Hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it spoke volumes about, I think Spice was just going out the door. You know, I've always got to keep my, my thumb on like the, the trends and what people are spending money on and Spice, E-Juice, Kratom, 
now it's the CBD. None of it's ever good for pipes. If you're if you're relying on supplemented income to purchase high end glass art, then you've got the wrong business model. Yeah, I agree totally. Hell yeah. Well, at least now that that you're you know got the flow going with the glass roots in Madison and the people would know about it and they're attending it. And now that you're doing the shows and the educational seminars, and I mean, it's, it's awesome that you have this, this whole series going on now. And if you want to, uh, kind of talk about, like you're saying with, uh, Darby coming in, doing his make a better bong thing, what else you got going on this year? Yeah. Darby would be our, uh, our master class, if you will. Um, the high end class, his class will be upstairs from the trade show happening and it'll be in a, a room called the um, Grand View Terrace, I believe is what it's called. But it's top to bottom window wrapped room overlooking the lake. So we're going to set him up right in front of the windows. And 12 people, I, I think there's 10, possibly 11 spots filled. I think we have one or two left. You know, we charged a lot. It's 1500 bucks per seat for the class. Um, we chose Darby uh, for one because he's never been to the show. And it was a great way to introduce him. But also, out of respect, I wanted to choose a, a true piper through and through um, to represent the start to this high-end idea. And um, Lauren Stump is going to be next year, and he's not a true piper. But he's also, from what I understand, I've never met him very good with our crowd. And I have a tentative yes. I mean, he gave that to me. Who knows what the hell happened. But uh, I felt good about the email I got from him. But we really want to find people who are well-spoken, well-educated, have a body of work, are conscious of, you know, family man. I, I went to Darby because he's got kids, mm -hmm. so I know he knows how to teach on that level, too. You know, not just, yeah. you know, I mean, being being a father and having, like, twins, I think he's got three kids total, for sure, too, um, and they're in their 20s. Man, you know, I mean, that's... It's a whole different walk of life. So there's there was a number of reasons why I felt like Darby was a good fit. Um, and then we have nine classes happening over the course of three days. And each day starts with a discussion from 10 a.m. to noon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then there's two classes that run simultaneously from noon to three. And two of the days, on one side it's scientific and on the other it's art. And I'm going to fuck up here and not know the exact schedule, but I know Tito is doing a talk on basically, I think it's called the, the day the industry stopped or stood still. So pipe dreams, headhunter. And I believe he's got Jason Harris coming out and I think he's going to interview Saeed. Uh, I don't think turfs can make it, but you know, he, he was focusing on, and I know they've tried to get Tommy Chong, but I'm sure that it's Tommy Chong's kid that we we need to get yeah exactly yeah you know? yeah yep. but he's 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 the you know the ticket they just used tommy to to get to his kid basically. yeah he, he the took the fall around. for it they used his kid <laughs> yeah they used his kid to get to however you want to say it yeah but um that that's one of the talks and germ is going to speak on one of the mornings um on well now he can call it the success of his kickstarter yeah dude i had him on um, uh two episodes ago talking about it and i listened to it so yep, awesome definitely so he we, we were talking a week ago and i said what is this going to specifically be on and he said well we got to find out how the kickstarter goes <laughs> 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 so so now that it's successful I'm, I'm confident that that's what the focus will be on is uh but also i hope he talks about the the resistance that he got from certain not, you know, everybody's afraid to, to, to name drop or call, but just aspects of the industry that I, I know he received. Um, I don't know if it was due to jealousy or what, but what that man is doing, I really hope is a, a pinnacle. I hope Vice shows up and fucking does something on that. Right, dude, I mean, it's it's like, gonna it's gonna change his life, and if it if it's successful, like it's I think it's gonna be, it's gonna change the perspective of our industry completely. Right. Yeah. Well, it is going to be successful because he's got the energy. You know, that, that money is nothing more than energy, yeah. right? I mean, you can look at it as, like, dollar bills, or you can look at it as, here's the fuel or the coal or the wood or whatever the fuck you want to refer it to, the wood pellets, for this thing to happen, and in order for it to have the sustenance to sustain for a year or however long it takes him to make the thousand cranes, right? So yeah. that's how I looked at it was, like, those dollar bills are nothing but energy. And if this man, and he's, he was given that energy. And I believe that 
people trusted him, obviously enough, with their money that he'll succeed. And look at who he surrounds himself with. I mean, he's he's working in a studio with Swinger, who's you know, I know him. Uh, I can say I've never like been to his house, but I've hung out with him a number of times, and I've done a lot of business with him and been to his studio. Supported was one of the only people to give him five grand for that movie, Glassroots, back in 2010. Hmm. It was like the only five grand I had. Uh, look at who he's surrounded himself with. You know, I know Snick is back in there, but he's surrounded himself with determined, accomplished people. And when you do that, uh, you're going to be successful yourself. I mean, those books aren't just lying when they say that you are who your friends are. Yeah, it's that circle you know? of five, dude. I absolutely, I completely agree. Something I preach all the time. So, I mean, I'm sure in the back of his head, Slinger doing what he did was the drive for Germ to separate. And I don't even know if most people know they work, you know, in the same studio, but I knew that. And it's not surprising to see Jeremy step up and do something like this for himself. Yeah. And you're exactly right. This could totally change. I mean, this is big time, like any genre of glass working. This is big time. Yeah, it is. It's huge. Hell yeah, yeah, and also just um, just kind of put it out there. I'm gonna I'll have all the schedule and the links and everything for the trade show for the three days on the show notes, and then also on your uh, the link on the website for for the show too. So anybody that wants to see what's gonna be happening, I'll have everything there for you. Thank you. Let's. I should I should just mention Carmen Lozar is gonna be the third talk, and that's really important for a number of reasons. Uh, so what? I've always tried to do and have never usually been successful is bridge the two worlds. And when I heard Mickelson in front of me say, while holding that blue bike, like we talked about earlier, you know, and saying, why put a push in it? Why, why, you know, put a push bowl in it. I've always thought, what the fuck is the difference from that day on? That's always stuck in my head. So I'm not a flea market. You know, I'm a trade show, Glassroots Art Show, and I named it for a specific reason, and that that name is completely usable in any aspect of glass, right? So it doesn't just have to be pipes, and I've always tried to encourage or target or market to non-pipe makers, mm -hmm. like Margaret Zinzer. Margaret Zinzer's had a booth at my show four times, I think, uh, sold nothing but her beads and non-functional you know non-pipe stuff she does phenomenally well at the show and i've had a, a number of people and now this year you know there's more and more i know tim kaiser's coming back out great scott glass aj manger there's a lot of millie stuff that goes on but um going after a teacher who's an actual you know education teacher in a college like carmen that is accredited around the world and to get her to say yes, it just fucking skyrocketed me. You know, to yeah, a I different can imagine, direction. dude. Her glass is incredible. I'm looking at some pictures now too. Like I've I've loved her work for a long time. Right. So you know, uh, right away I I wanted to get Paramore back to to do the classes this year are going to be much more structured, to the point. Um, <laughs> we just we decided like 45 days before the show last year we were going to do an education project, and then put it together and made it happen. And there was a tremendous amount of knowledge gained, but it was not nearly as dialed in, if you will, as what it is this year. So oh, I've yeah. got Berserker coming out, doing his Dicro thing. Um, Mickelson's going to do a hollow form. Uh, Jay Howard, I think, is going to do some stuff on glasses. He, his class is called Jedi Mind Trick. Um, Tim and, or no, uh, Tracy Dreyer and Eric Moraine, I believe is how it's called. Uh, pronounced uh, Wild Rose Gallery in Madison. I mean, Tracy's, I'm pretty sure he's been a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison for, I'm going to venture to say, between 20 and 25 years. Wow. And bringing that kind of guy to teach a lathe class, you know, as opposed to bringing Mobius out, who's also teaching a lathe class, you're talking opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. Maybe there will be crossover, but... You know, so I really tried to get both sides, you know, very ingrained pipe makers and also people who don't make pipes at all. Like, you know, Jason Howard makes very little. Roger Paramore doesn't. Carmen Lozard doesn't. I know I'm, I'm missing a few here, too, of uh, some of the other classes that we're doing. But, you know, I think you get the point that I tried to pick something 
for everybody. Yeah, it seems super diverse with artists, and that's what that's what I think is a beauty with our industry and the community in general, the art community and the glass is this kind of crossover. I mean, you got like Ethan, Wind, you know, uh, Wendy coming across, you know, like all these other all these guys out there that are a fantastic artists in their whole right in their own kind of niche that they're now collaborating with the pipe makers and these pipe makers. I mean, I've, I do that even to today. I still say like, I think some of the most incredible talented artists in the world are some of the pipe makers in our industry. Some of the stuff that these guys are making is just phenomenal. And then to see them collaborating with non pipe making glass artists, you know, it's just like I'm waiting for like the Lucio Babacos and those kind of cats to come across and start doing some collaborations with us. Well, they've come across it. They just, those type of guys, Unless if I think an artist specifically struck their fancy, why would they deviate from the plan? Yeah, you know, you're, you you just named somebody that his work sells, and and I think a lot of the people who were a generation younger than him, like the uh, Paramore Mickelson um, Barrow generation, mm-hmm. like a bunch of those guys, uh, Mylan, at some point after the crash happened in what like eight or nine. I don't think anybody could sell stuff that wasn't pipes. So it was truly just finances that pushed, I think, a lot of these guys um, from one industry to the other, if you will. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because I've always well, said, like, I, I, oh, go on. No, go ahead. I'll say, like, back in the day when I was doing production spoons, I was always like, man, I wish I could just make a perfume bottle and sell this as a perfume bottle. But I knew if I just pushed a bowl and popped the hole and made a carb, I could sell it right away. <laughs> you know, it sucks, right. but it's the reality of the business, you know? Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with some of these high end guys that jumped over into the pipe scene. Once they start to get a lot of success with it, if they don't just go back because they've re lit the flame for their name, if you will. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of the pipe collectors like myself, of a large pipe collection, mainly gained through trade from booths. I take probably 80% trade from vendors for their booth costs and have since 2009. And nice. Hustle it to you know any number of shops or keep stuff. But I'm, for one, I don't collect rigs at all. I don't believe that 10 years from now or 50 years from now, most rigs are going to be worth um, nearly what some of the high-end rigs are selling for now. I'm not talking about the elaborate, you know, crazy Clinton shit and banjo shit that's like true sculptor and well thought out with the female joint placed on it somewhere. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just like, I, I, I'm not going to name names, but you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Productions yeah. wise. So I've, I've gotten bored with a lot of what's being made. You know, Zach P still impresses the shit out of me. Ethan Windy, like you said, I, and I love looking at uh, ghost and coil stuff things that still focus on the howl form you know and it, it's not just a rig but otherwise push bowls sherlock's non-functional you know not necessarily marbles but like pieces of art like carmen does uh and i, I hope that more of these people that are spending five and ten grand on a on a radiculator uh realize that there's these amazing artists that are making true one-offs and not in a series of a hundred and that's art, you know. I yep. mean, you know, you get what I'm saying. Oh yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Yep. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. I, I don't think there's a bubble necessarily that's gonna pop. It's just gonna be the way that the industry is gonna have to pivot as technology changes, especially in the in the whole the whole concentrate community. You know, with all the, the vape pens and everything else going on. I mean, who knows if the rig is even gonna become irrelevant one day because of the the technology. Well, I hope you the know. industry that you're talking about is all encompassing. Right. Yeah. And I know what you're saying too. And I agree. I think that's probably my favorite part of the collectors out there now is that they're not only just buying pipes or buying glass art. They're, they appreciate, they understand now what goes into what they're smoking out of. So now they're going out and they're buying art to look at, you know, that's, it still serves a purpose and is functional and makes you smile. You know, you can't use it necessarily in that sense, but it's still, it's still the appreciation there. I mean, you go all the way back to Dale Chihuly, who really started the the whole home studio movement back in the seventies. That's where it is now. The technology is changing everything else. You know, I mean, even still at Disney to this day, people are like, oh, you know Dale Chihuly? You know who he is? I'm like, yeah, of course. Or I hear like Chihuky. Like people can't even say his name right. But you, you know, but the, the, you have these names now in our in our functional glass scene that are going to become household names and just art 
in general, like Germ. You know, Jer- people will know him hopefully as Jeremy Grant Levine, not as Germ. You know, he would actually right. have his real name out there, which I think you know. And I, like when I was talking about Luke Zimmerman, we talked about in the past show about trying to trademarks and copywriting and names and stuff, and you know the salts and the banjos and the elbows and everybody else coil. You know. Th- all these cats that have these names now that's become their brand, but hopefully one day they'll have their actual born given name out there in the art world that people will know this is who this is made by. This is, you know, this is his company, this brand, but this is actually who the guy is or the gal is, you know, it's, it's, you got to admit though, it's pretty neat when someone comes in and says, can I get a salt or yeah. a slinger or yeah. a snick? I mean, even when yeah. I hear that shit, I'm just like, that's fucking so cool. Yeah, you know, and it is. it's, it's it's a different way to brand. You know, I totally agree that we should... You know, I don't even know if some of these guys use it, though, as a means to protect their name as much as they do. Their heroes were probably graffiti artists that just made a name up because mm-hmm. of, obviously, protection reasons. But, um, you know, I go back and forth on it. On You know, do I hope that all these guys reveal someday? And would they even? If it was full legalized across the board, would you really leave slinger and go to your real name you know or banjo to the real name you know i don't i don't know if they would or not yeah i don't know either be curious to find out (laughs) 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 absolutely so uh yeah man so glass roots is going on october 10th and the 12th and yeah it's like anybody out there that's going i'm definitely uh, myself personally, like I had said before we started, um, I'm still planning on coming out there. I'm just on hold right now with my gig ever at Disney because I got some things going on behind the scenes. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to take the time off. But if I do, we had talked about it, I'll be there the first two days for sure, at least. I'm looking forward to all that. And uh, did we cover all the, sh- all the all the classes, dude? Did I cut you off on that? Yeah, I think I forgot a couple, but I mean, we, we spoke about it. I think people get the point. And it's 200 bucks. Cool. And we did 100 bucks last year, and I know people are like, oh, you raised it 100 bucks. But I mean, that room to rent is thousands of dollars a day, and yeah. I'm paying these teachers. Last year, I didn't really pay them shit, and I didn't expect much out of them. This year, I'm trying to you know, actually treat it like a real class, and I'm paying these teachers well, and I know the teachers recognize that. It just needs to relate over to these lamp workers and it seems like more lamp workers from around the country than in the midwest are purchasing these tickets that's kind of a disappointment to me you know i had hoped that more midwest people and maybe it'll just be at the door sales if we don't sell out of the 100 tickets but we limit it to 100 and that yes that is twenty thousand dollars if i sell all 100 you know and we've already like worked out deals with the vendors so i mean my budget i lose money in all aspects of what i do with lamp working yeah, from the sure. show it's, yeah. it's, it's a fucking it's a write-off it's always been a laugh you know and and dude we we donate uh to toot the horn a little bit i mean i have supported the michigan glass project from the start armadillo from the start colorado project when it existed from the start um and the illinois project we're a patron sponsor of germs video you know we we basically take the, any profit financially other than the pieces that I take for collection, and we put it right back into the industry. Awesome. And if it wasn't for the kombucha business that we run, I would probably be fucking bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, dude, it's, it's, it's a write-off, man. It's a give-back. It, it, it really is. Well, tell me about that, dude. So you guys make your home, uh, home, homemade kombucha? Uh, we're, we're a company. Um, in the beginning, Glassroots got tapped a lot off the ground. Uh, now I would say, I mean, Glasser does good. We, we, you know, financially, I'm in, I'm able to employ, uh, two different people next year. It'll probably be three, but yes, we, um, we run a company. It's my wife's company, Tapawat Kombucha. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not small anymore. It grew fast. I mean, we're in, uh, as many stores as we want to be in and she, creates everything herself it's it's a damn good kombucha i've had kombuchas from all over the country and there's there's very few that uh that i've found that compare huh i'll have to try some because i that's definitely one of our my wife and i definitely uh partake <laughs> yeah, like how about you, um there's uh well gt's is everywhere but um bc 221 i don't know where you are in florida but there's a lady who 
her husband's from Sister Bay right up the road from me, and they're making kombucha in Florida, and it's starting to get around pretty good. Rad. It's called BC221. Okay. Yeah, the lady's name's Annetta. But yes, we have found uh, a lot of success in the kombucha. My wife um, just knows what she's doing with drinks and with graphics, apparently. So she's got like 14 different pints available in a lot of grocery stores. So it's a large line. Um, it's it's definitely what takes up more of our time now that we've got class roots. Uh, Ryan uh, started working with us last June, and um, he runs the shit at this point the day to day I, I deal with like the the sponsors and the people who would be offended if ryan called them <laughs> otherwise ryan <laughs> ryan definitely does all the fucking email stuff the i got to take my number off of the website which was pretty sweet um allison was working for us allison key the michigan glass project uh and that's someone who you should that that lady deserves a big old fucking pat on the back and so does craig lewis uh, for what they do with their their charity organizations the the armadillo art glass initiative and the michigan glass project and to see them help each other and go to each other's events too is just really good to see yeah you know, there, there are some, yeah really good things really positive things i mean i'm pretty sure Craig did like 45 or 50 grand last year to Meals on Wheels. Um, raised in like three fucking days, you know, wow, by amazing. making pipes. Yeah. It is amazing. And I'm pretty sure, I haven't heard the number yet this year. Maybe I just ain't paying attention. But Allison, I know she's working towards a much larger number than even that this year. I think she did 50 last year as well to Art Road. Um, but that's something that I, I hope more and more people find out about. It seems like with Allison's online um, commitment and publicizing what she's doing that a lot of people got turned on to her show. But Craig's fucking thing is, you know, no joke either. He just doesn't have the social media presence. Yeah. Yeah, I tried bringing the, uh, the Michigan Glass Project on the show before they did it this year. I just, logistically-wise, we couldn't make the timing work out. But uh, I definitely want to have them on to talk about, I mean, I mean every, any, any kind of show out there that's doing some kind of charitable work, I'd love it. I want to bring them on and promote them. When I should give props to uh, Drew. Drew definitely is one of the original people. Blade, Sean Mueller, he's he's the guy that moved from Colorado, who started the Colorado Project, and then moved to Detroit with his wife. And they opened up a glass craft bri- briefly for with Dave, and I know that it didn't, I don't know what happened, but that's no longer there. He no longer works with glass craft, but I know he had a hand in starting the Michigan Project. He probably gave Allison, like, the guidelines to whatever they did in Colorado. Um, So, really, I don't know how many people know that, but, like, he deserves full credit for all these projects, that Mm -hmm. whole idea. I mean, that was was 100%, from what I understand, his idea. I know there was a lot of people who helped him get it off the ground in Colorado. Um, And then look at what happened after that. There was an Arizona and Illinois and East Coast. I'm pretty sure Darby and Leela do an Oregon thing. Um, Not quite to the extent of what you know, uh, these other companies are doing, but I mean, now it's a fucking thing, you know, like Michigan is hopefully going to like pay themselves one of these years and and not just donate everything and like realize that it's a real business that they're running. I mean, if you're taking in 150 K and then you have to pay 50 grand at bills and you got to keep money for next year, I don't know what they're going to do this year, but I'm looking at these pieces sell online and they're going for like 5 K, 8 K. I mean, it's, so cool. Fucking awesome. It's definitely really neat to see. But yeah, she was with the show, and uh, I'm, she's been doing Definitely try and get her on. But I got to give a, a props to um, Amy McKesson then and uh, Sarah Hauser, who helped Craig do his thing. And I know there's other people too, but those two people. And uh, Drew Cups and Jeremy Ross, Adam Thomas, uh, Mark Vandenberg. Um, Man, there's one other, David Smith, all those dudes. I mean, that whole Michigan thing, they're a crew. And Allison is basically like the, the mama bear. You know, Allison's family has a huge hand in it. But they're going into schools. I mean, they're showing kids glass blowing right in front of them. Yeah. And they're bringing art back to schools that don't fucking have art. It just doesn't even exist. Yeah. So, you know, and they opened up the Belle Isle Aquarium. 
which was huh. like, uh, yeah, they, they did their first two Michigan projects to raise money for the Belle Isle. And the first year they did it, they got it open again. And the second year, I want to say they gave even more money and now it's open, open, like with fish in it. Yeah, they brought us all there and we got to see the remnants of it. And I mean, it was like one of the keynotes for Detroit, I'm assuming, back in the day. Too cool, man. Hell yeah, brother. Well, I hate to cut this short, dude. I got get, I got some stuff I have to go get done that my wife reminded me about. <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah, dude, but again, it was an honor having you on, and I appreciate you sharing the stories and the, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff. I think the uh, audience is going to get a kick out of it, so for sure, and hopefully the, the cats <laughs> involved won't mind either. <laughs> So I know we're, we're all a bunch of crazy assholes when it comes down to it. So, <laughs> so it is all good. We just got to share the love. Well, I was happy to share, Jason. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, no problem, man. If you want to real quick tell us uh, where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace, and then uh, we'll let you get going. I didn't catch that last part. Oh, where, where do you want to find you out in there in cyberspace? Websites, um, that kind of stuff. com. Sweet. And then you're on so face, Facebook glass- also? Facebook, yep, we're very active on Instagram and Facebook. I'm pretty sure it's Glassroots on Instagram. Uh, I don't know. I, I use my wife's shit. I don't have my own, so I, I just, uh, what do they call it? Um, <laughs> lurker, whatever. On <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mr. Flip uh, Phone. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes, I, I am doing this interview on a flip phone. It's awesome. I definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Well, I'll have all the links to all the everything that you guys have out there. We'll be in the uh, show notes for everybody to go check out and you know, again, it was an honor, brother. And uh, next year, we'll definitely bring you back on and talk about next year. And uh, you know, anytime you want to come on the show and discuss politics, topics, glass talk, shop talk, dude, I'm all about it, brother. All right. Well, thank you. Hell yeah, and enjoy that uh, quote unquote fall weather you guys have. Because let's see, it's uh, it's uh, almost 90 degrees in my garage where I'm recording this right now. Oh man, yeah, I'm 62. I'm about to go out and cut some grass and just enjoy the day with the kids. It's definitely fall. Hell yeah. My favorite time. Yeah, me too. When it, Once Halloween gets here, then it starts to cool down. So <laughs> we got another <laughs> month. But all good, man. So I uh, hope you all enjoyed this talk with Nick and Glass Roots and everything else. And if you're going to be going, definitely say hey out there. And uh, if I'm out there myself, I'll be checking everybody out and saying hey and doing interviews and chit-chatting and kissing babies and hugging and all that good shit. So uh, and mind your business when you're out there. Definitely don't uh, make smoke alarms go off in the hotels. <laughs> we don't want that again <laughs> this year. <laughs> so, hell yeah, dude. Well, again, thanks, Nick. I'll talk to you soon, brother. Oh, shit. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com.
Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night. Thank you.